the job. Now, next week, the British Pharmacological Society is devoting uh, a whole day to Colin, so I, I'm not going to, to uh, reprise some of the stuff that all of you are here, except to say a few things. One was that he was, of course, the British Clinical Pharmacology. Um,
Right, what have I missed? Where's Alex? Turn us down. What the fuck do I need to wash my hands for? All right, Aiden. Well, you can't hear this. It says stream yard is sharing. What was happening with the families of our patients? That sounds brilliant, doesn't it? We use technology to mean that? that people who couldn't be at the bedside could have some idea of what's going on. But let me tell you, the burden of telling a family that their loved one is dying via Zoom is something that you carry with you. We also had to innovate to cope with the supply chains not being as strong as we'd hoped. Uh, and these are just some examples difficulties with acquiring the neuromuscular blockade drugs that we need to give patients general anesthesia so that we can ventilate them when they're sick uh, that meant that people like the association of anesthetists had to generate guidelines uh, and produce advice about how to use drugs we had not used in decades so i think it's fair to say that most intensivists had not used pancuronium for at least 10 years uh, but we used it during the pandemic um, other problem that hit us quite hard at one point in wave one is the supply lines for renal replacement therapy came within 48 hours of us not being able to provide hemodiafiltration to intensive care patients in the UK. Lots of people had different solutions for this. What did you do Adam Ricks was that we installed SLED, so um, <laughs> super low efficiency dialysis, into the intensive care, in fact, into both intensive care units over a five day bank holiday weekend. Um, we would never have been able to do that at any other time. I wrote a business case that was one A4 side. I spoke to the chief financial officer and within four hours it was signed off and the order placed. Such a thing has never happened before and probably will never happen since. We also innovated for research, as Natalie said, we embedded it in routine clinical care. And this is just a timeline mapping some of the UK's response that was embedded into NHS care. So the first case in the UK of COVID-19 was identified on the 31st of January. The ISARIC 4C collaborative of phenotyping patients was launched on the 6th of February. Uh, and by the 19th of March, the recovery trial had started. By June of that year, we knew that hydroxychloroquine didn't work and that dexamethasone did, uh, and that another antiviral therapy was not effective. And again, the results from that work has continued to deliver, but it delivered because patients across the NHS and the infrastructure built by the National Institute for Health Research over 10 years was able to be mobilized. We had the infrastructure that we needed to deliver for our patients and to embed care for the first time across the entire NHS. Research was everybody's business. Well, what has changed? Absolutely everything has changed. Some of it has been good, some of it has been bad, but none of us and nothing about the way we practice intensive care will ever be the same again. Well, if you needed some examples of the front line, what are a couple of amazing talks? We're going to talk about those later, but before we have time to discuss, let me just um, move on to a, two more presentations. And these are going to be on the topic of going virtual, digitalization of healthcare during the pandemic. And I'm delighted to welcome our two speakers. First of all, Dr. Dave Fisker, who's a GP, and would like to have everyone to um, come and join us uh, here on the platform. And Mr. Jacob Haddad, who is co-founder of Accurix. We've really changed 
clinical practice, both here on the front line, but also in the way we deliver health services. So over, over to you, uh, Dr. Strisco, do you want to come up here? And then you pass on to another. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, so my name is Dave Trisco. I'm a GP partner in Surrey. I was the digital first lead for a couple of years for Surrey Heartlands, one of the most mature ICSs. And tasked to give a talk as a practicing GP about going virtual feels a little bit like being thrown into a political bear pit at the moment. But I hope I can provide some colour to what Jacob's going to talk about, which is the how do you deliver this side of things. I thought, first of all, really, I wanted to look back on was the scene at the start of the pandemic, perhaps not in the way that you think, which is about uh, where we were in general practice. So I think we're very good at looking at the now and critiquing, but we perhaps don't always think about where we were. And at the time, we'd just gone through the winter of 2019 with headlines in the Daily Mail saying it was an eight week to see a GP. So I think it would be fair to say that all was not rosy. Approaching into that outside, pandemic working, uh, I think a very good analogy would be to look at what would we do in, in business outside. and I'm, bear I'm with me. Line. So looking at how we practice during that time, essentially we had what you would refer to as right. 30 to 40 unscheduled does. client meetings during the day, which was scheduled for 10 minutes regardless of the need of the client with no idea of the agenda mm, from either party. Right. And I think if one was constructing primary care from the ground up. So there must that be a fucking be like Piers' thing. I can't... So, yeah. as with all testing situations, my previous job was as a uh, regimental medical officer for the oh, army yeah, for 10 it's... years, we found that testing situations provide novel solutions and often unintended benefits. So what did digital bring? And what do I mean by digital? Now, I would like to think of digital as returning us to core uh, values of general not practice, then, not, then. not the move away from it, which it is portrayed. And I think it's very important to realize that digital and tech is a tool and how one uses it is, gives the importance of what that tool is. You can use a great tool badly and a bad tool efficiently. Witness all our electronic patient records and the uh, rather difficult machinations we have to do with them. So what did digital do for us and what did we deliver? Well, the, the pandemic showed that we had all of a sudden even less capacity than we did before. We no longer had safety nets, patients weren't able to access them both through pandemic working restrictions and also through the sheer quantity of uh, consultations that we needed at that time. So digital working essentially for me was about how do we deliver at that moment continuity of care with knowledge of those patients, so longitudinal care, which is the cornerstone of primary care and indeed probably the NHS, and how do we do that in a way that's safe and efficient for everyone? And, and, and Jacob's company was a huge part of this. So Accurix, for those who aren't aware of it, uh, is a company that helps us deliver uh, essentially data communications between patients and clinicians. And in my job as a primary care physician, the most important thing that I have to know is what is wrong with the patient and what do they need from me? Now, that may seem as if that's a very obvious uh, question to ask, but I can assure you that if someone who's waited for three weeks to see a GP has to perform on the spot and give a, a perfect medical interview, regardless of the skills of that physician, they are going to struggle. Right so as well as that knowledge, what we delivered with digitization of healthcare was preparation and asynchronicity. So asynchronous communication is that where essentially we give people time. So the time that we don't have as GPs to do the <coughs> calling Here's and understand the needs, sort of uh, because we simply don't place. have enough of us, was actually now delivered through digitalized healthcare. So this is a mechanism through online portals, uh, which our patients can access directly, often 24 hours a day, which is hitherto unheard of access to primary care, and have the time and space to make those assessments of their needs in a fashion that suits them. The important bit about this delivery is, is that it mustn't disadvantage those who are digitally not enabled. And of course, by freeing up that time to spend with those patients, by having patients able to communicate with us in a way that suits them means the, the digitally less enabled are actually protected. So for patients, digitization of healthcare during a pandemic removed barriers. Rather than putting up barriers, as is often uh, portrayed in the media, we broke them down completely. So I don't know of many medical specialties where one can access a clinician of 30 years knowledge at the drop of a hat with very little in the way of barriers to that access. You can access it repeatedly. You can access it as your need arises. You can access it without delay. 
So from a, a states where patients had an eight week wait, uh, at my own practice in, in Whitley, uh, we had, went down to under 50 minutes wait to have senior clinician input to a case. This is the power of asynchronous and digitalized technologies where it's the starting point for a conversation and a consultation, not the end of it for a patient. So now technology is an augmenter. And I really want to talk to you about what did that look like in practice? For what admittedly is a humble primary care center in a small village just outside of Guildford. You say? The first thing that we got rid of was appointments. There are no appointment lengths. Appointment lengths, as I mentioned in the starting uh, address, was that a 10 minute appointment for any such problem seems completely ludicrous. How could I care for people who had palliative care needs? How could I care for people who were suicidal? It's impossible and patients suffered as a result. And this is when I go back to what was it like pre-digitalization and patients were suffering in that system and did not have the care that they required. Now what happens is because we have that communication from patients beforehand, we can assess their needs and actually provide them with the care that they need with the person who's appropriate for them. The clinician with the most need, the clinician with, excuse me, the most knowledge, the clinician with the most experience, the right person, the right place, the right time for that patient. Imagine then having had that appointment, you leave with an instant summary of what's happened to you. We all know that for most patients, less than 30% of what occurs in a consultation is retained. Leaving the appointment with myself at the moment and any of my partners in my practice, the patient has a full digitized care summary presented to them on their phone forevermore, telling them where they need to go, what they need to do, and indeed using technology with automated reminders about when, when their care episodes are, when they may need to reattend for tests, what they may need to do next. All of a sudden, what looks like a harsh and remote technology, which can be a block to care, is in fact a warm and enveloping blanket for these patients. There is no longer any reason they don't feel that their condition is fully engaged with their care. Spinning out of this, uh, we have a huge need for patients that are, is outstripping our demand uh, uh, supply at the moment for things like chronic disease care using technology such as group video consultations, community-based interventions are now possible with patients who may not have been able to access them during the pandemic. Systemic long-term condition management goes on apace, allowing us to draw in data from patients who are able to access us in that way so that we can prioritize care for those who need us the most. It clearly makes no sense for us to spend our time chasing people who are well, and don't need much for their long-term condition management, where we can use novel techniques such as uh, what's referred to as Flory questionnaires, essentially long-term health uh, condition questionnaires that the patients can submit to their GP, who they've probably known for a good portion of their life, who can work out if they have a need. So the future, why don't we all do this? Well, clearly I'm a convert and I would say that we should. And I would say that this is something that could be delivered across both health and social care, and indeed in other sectors. What's the difficulty? Well, we enter a brave new frontier, much like in the early days brave of Afghanistan, no. we were learning how to deal with patients with hitherto unseen injuries. We're learning how to deal with mechanisms of communicating with patients that we've never used before. Not everyone is an expert yet, but there is time. And this in an NHS, it's an increasing pressure. We must utilize the resources that we have and use them in the best possible way. I so in summary, I would like to say that in my experience of pandemic working, technology has augmented clinical care. It's not replaced it. And it has allowed us to deliver a more traditional model where patients are cared for by their GP at times that suit them with care that they That's need. That's what you said, Thank Corinne. You. That's literally what you said for us to seek instruction. Mr. Jacob Haddad from, from the phone. AcuRx founder, co-founder. Thanks so much, Dave. And there's nothing more motivating for our team than hearing uh, experiences like that from the front line. So I'm going to quickly talk about how we how we innovated during this time. And if you look at two years ago, um, if you had a mole on your arm or maybe a rash that you were concerned about, and you contacted your GP practice on the phone. Uh, they'd book you in for an appointment, you'd come in, you'd have it seen to, then maybe you'd be referred. Today, pretty much every GP practice in the country, if you contact them with that same mole, they'll send you a text message, ask you to send in a photo, and then they'll decide what's best. Maybe they'll send that photo on to dermatology for some advice and guidance. If two years ago you needed a fit note, 
uh, contact your practice. Maybe you'd have a phone consultation then, but you'd need to come into the practice to collect that piece of paper. Today, you get sent a text. Who message, is this link, child? Download it and then do, do what you need with it. And two years ago, if you needed a flu jab, you'd get a text, maybe even a letter telling you to call up the practice, speak to someone in reception, book an appointment. Today, if you need a COVID booster in most practices, you'll be sent an SMS with a link. You can follow it and, and, and book that appointment. Now, in all of these examples, those needs were there long before COVID, and those needs are going to be there long after COVID. We haven't built anything you know, specific to the virus, specific to the pandemic, but what the pandemic did was accelerate uh, the urgency of addressing those latent needs and finding a solution. And often as a, a company, we look at you know, the speed of decision making in healthcare and, and get fr quite frustrated and try and understand it. And when we do, it's we what see a lot of decisions being made to minimize risk, not to maximize opportunity. You know, where can things go wrong rather than how can we improve care for these patients? And what happened during COVID is not taking those opportunities became a risk because that patient who couldn't come and get their sick note couldn't get their benefits payment, or because that patient with a mole they were concerned about couldn't get couldn't get it seen by dermatology, or maybe they'd come into the practice but put themselves and others at risk of infection. Video consultations is something that got an awful lot of attention all the way from the Secretary in the of State of Health. You know, that megaphone's, that, that, that megaphone's there. And interestingly, we learned they weren't actually as helpful as everyone hoped. Um, and I think Dave's description is a very good one of um, they are a tool in a That's tool. Muted. You can hear him. Patients are very good at understanding when to use them and when not. Generally, we think of video as quite overhyped, but actually that Pierce. messaging, that asynchronous yeah. communication that Dave Go talked about boy. is quite underhyped. It's quite easy uh, if, you're right, if you want to write a, an article legends, to put a though, picture right? at the top They're of a doctor in a white legends, coat right? with a stethoscope. Uh, there's loads of stock photos of them and trying to explain it. But messaging is, is sort of harder to wrap your head around how that helps. But to give you some idea of scale, um, for every mute. video consultation we do now, we send 100 messages that? to patients. Not appointment reminders or batch messages, but the vitamin well, D so you just go to the pharmacy and get some. Is. Um, you know, I've got your your repeat prescription request, but you need to do this blood test first. Um, real clinical interactions that would have previously been appointments. And for some idea of scale, today in the NHS in England, there'll be around a, a million GP appointments. And around half of those, there'll be a messaging interaction. Like Where this gets really interesting is when you look at the health economics. So pretty much every economy in the world is struggling with spiraling healthcare costs. And there are a number of different reasons, but one of the biggest is that over the past few decades, healthcare has seen neg negative productivity growth, where other sectors have seen po positive productivity growth, because it's an inherently human uh, profession where we're reliant on one-to-one -one interactions. But actually what Dave described of moving towards asynchronous interactions allows us to start to see those, those productivity growth. And so as a company, we look at healthcare and we see it as a communication industry. When, when we were finding our feet, we went and spent three months in GP practice, just shadowing and understanding what people were doing and quite quickly saw it was making referrals, getting second opinions, coordinating care, getting information to a patient. It was all, all communication. That's where the value was added. But also when things went wrong, it was because of a breakdown in communication. So we've got this vision that everyone who's involved in a patient's care can communicate with each other. Obviously it includes the patient and their family. Um, and that's pretty uncontroversial, but incredibly hard to do. Um, now, the big challenge coming, you know, where we are now, um, almost two years since the pandemic started, is a lot has changed. And at the same time, actually, lots of things haven't changed. So if you're getting referred as a patient, it's still quite a transactional interaction. You don't know, really know what's going on between two siloed organizations with, you know, where all the, all the communication just sits in that one letter. You've got type 2 diabetes and you need those eight quite simple processes of care, your feet checked, your cholesterol, your eyes checked once a year. You've got roughly 50% likelihood of actually having all of those happen. Um, and so all these, these challenges, if you, you know, you're an ED doctor and a patient comes in and their renal function is low, you're trying to work out if it's acute or chronic, you still need to get on the phone, try and get hold of that GP practice, maybe wait in a queue, maybe you, know, you get sent their record by fax. So there's still a huge huge way to go. So how do we use digital technology to address some of the current challenges? And when I say current challenges, 
you know, everyone knows about the six million patients on a waiting list. There's many more patients who aren't making it onto waiting lists because they can't be referred at the moment. The 90,000 staff vacancies in the system, the challenges getting access to, you know, general practices, uh, GP practices that aren't, haven't yet moved uh, to such efficient ways of working. Um, so there's a few quick learnings I'll, I, will, I will whiz through that we need to take from the pandemic in, in moving forward. So one sounds pretty obvious, but sadly it's not. It's just focusing on the users and their problems, spending time on the front line, seeing the challenges people have, seeing how they work currently, um, and I'm really understanding the root causes we can, we can help. The second is bottom-up adoption. What we mean by that is building interventions, whether they're technology or other, <laughs> ah, what do you mean? Chat. Chat. What happened? They threw us out, boys. Why have we been fucking thrown out? The fuck? How the fuck did that happen? What the fuck? <laughs> Absolute cunts. Have you got Germany? Well trained. Oh really? You used a fake name. Yeah, join the stream. Yeah, we were with them motherfucking pussies. Wow. Oh wow! You know after that witty. Well, I'm confused. I'm lost. Two, two, Wait, how do I get a link? Kids came up to me and I'm fucking being spastic. We are not. We are not going to get the old world back. So it's great what we did. And even afterwards, the stewards who were hosting the Universe event, they were actually giving us a lot of support afterwards as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the aggro. No. Yo. One of them. Got no noise. Got no noise out. No sound. What do you mean, how? How am I supposed to do that? You're supposed to do that, you fucking nutter. Do it again. Make sure you click share audio. Why have we been kicked out, though? What sort of... We ain't even asked a fucking question. Like, what the fuck? It's all right for them to record it, but it's not right for me to stream it. <laughs> okay. Can we get a share up then? What's going on, Alex? What are you doing? 
Oh, George Fearsome. The leaflets, boycott those crooked stores so, like the Tesco's so and all of that. Like that. Spend yeah. cash, keep the cash in circulation, well, do all these little things and communi com communicate with people. Don't self-censor yourself. We're going to win this, but everyone needs to get on board. Every little action, every little thing is going to count. And we're going to turn this around and we can see it growing day by day when we're on the street. Let's go. Come on. Yes. Hey, wait, uh, can I just ask you another question? It's interesting probably for people to hear that might not know this, but pretty much you have this as a family activity. Yeah, your, my whole family. Your mother, work. your brother. Your brother, your girlfriend. But this is my brother. We're yep. all very strong and, and very vegan. together. And, and, and it's just about um, having that strength of character and being open with your family. You know, I've got to be honest. As well, to see what happens if you do flex those models and actually what the outcomes for patients might be. And I think the, the clinical issue that we haven't really nailed because during the pandemic, we flexed up. We didn't you, really I've been kicked off a bit. The being, no, we can't play things, like adverse events uh, where, from um, their street. I can't. Reality, I'll, I'll, you know, some of those things you really do need a lot more data. From your street. Yeah, all right. Well, I won't say nothing, but I'm, yeah, I'm struggling great. to get on it. But go on then. Right. hundred. Martin O'Kane from mm. MHRA asks, moving forward, how do we keep research, research embedded in the NHS for other indications? Who'd like to take that research question? Is that one for you, Charlotte? I think the answer is that we can never go back. The genie is out of the bottle now. Our patients should and will expect that research is part of their care. We all know that we can do it. We can deliver. How could we possibly ever think it's acceptable or ethical to go back to a situation where most patients aren't involved in research as part of their healthcare interaction? It absolutely has to remain and it has to grow from here, not go backwards. The innovation is clear and, and, and we've moved now to a situation where a lot of the human interaction is going to take place via technology. And um, my question is, is anyone trying to find out how this impacts on patient satisfaction and patient recovery? Because we know that patients derive a lot of benefit from being cared for by a human being. So I wonder whether we can think about that balance. Who'd like to take that? If I could start. Um, so I, I think the, the ultimate end point of this is that there should there always needs to be an element of it, human face-to-face -face interaction of some kind. I think the, the future for the NHS lies in leveraging that moment of interaction as being as useful for both patients as clinicians as it can be. Many of these, and again, going back to what hasn't worked well, Many of these episodes in secondary and primary care have been wasted interactions where there's been things that should have done that haven't happened and need to happen later. So um, in terms of data gathering, so there's an enormous data set in primary care for this because we've delivered probably the most of the virtual interactions and patient satisfaction scores in practices are actually extremely good. And in, in the, those that use virtual and are largely more in keeping with what the care model and their delivery is like. So basically, are they cared for well or not? Not so much how they're cared for. So a colleague of mine, Professor Ruth wrote, um, Louise Rose, and I have been doing a study on virtual visiting in the ICU. And again, we did explore, you know, what patients' perceptions and family perceptions were of that. And I'd say generally it was positive, but it was a bit of a mixed bag. Some people did not like it because you can't capture the nuances in terms of those human interactions, as you say. So look, there are several questions. I, can I just take these, a couple here on inequalities and I'll come to you. There are two, several questions here. One from Anne-Louise Kimmont. Um, are there any data to support the idea that inequality in access or outcome is improved by the model you described? So there's the inequality question. And related to that, Liz says, what proportion of patients can cope with digital technology. Many older patients don't have or use mobile phones. How can side routes be developed to provide routes of communication? So that inequalities question, I think it's something which you did raise, but perhaps we could say a little bit more about that and uh, perhaps Jacob will come in as well. The danger of digital access, if you don't build a model that caters for the non-digital enabled is it's by its nature unequal. If you prioritize digital access over traditional models of access, you are doing a disservice to people who are vulnerable. The key to the model delivery is ensuring that regardless of point of entry into the care system, 
the outcome and care delivery is the same. So using my own practice as an example, whether or not people contact us by coming in the building, phoning us, using our online portal, the access we have to the is the same, and we map all of those interactions with the same system that we use. Um, it, it's very important to do this, or you allow, as, as sometimes we need to say, people to leap from that system. But going back, just to go back to what are traditional models of care, previously your access to primary care, my profession, was how quickly could you hit redial at eight o'clock in the morning? So let's not pretend that the old models were perfect. Many thanks. And I think um, another question from the room. Thank you. Great presentation. Sorry, I'm Lynn and I'm a, a patient and just want to pick up something about building the model. So I'm just wondering who you're building the model with. And I would really love if you could give me an example of the way that the patients or service users have been involved and what you've done in co-producing um, the model. So, I think this is a really good question, something that actually we've put a lot more focus on since the start of the pandemic, um, of involving patients in, patients in that user research. The main thing we found from research with patients is, not only is there no one size fits all, but when you find a, you know, if you take a specific patient, one, you know, for, for one consultation, they might want to be seen face to face, and for another, they might just want a quick message. And they, um, we found that that flexibility is what patients really value and clinicians value too. And generally, they're pretty good, uh, you know, as a, as a jo joined up care team, a patient and a clinician at deciding like what's most appropriate. Um, answering both that and sort of related to the previous point as well of some of the data, you know, we haven't d done sort of studies yet or anything like that. But from the early data we've seen on things like, for example, COVID vaccine booking, in the first phase when you were still look, we were still looking at patients you know 80 plus and in care homes we were getting over 90 percent of patients self-booking often that was a family member helping them um and then you know that frees up a huge amount of time as dave mentioned for other patients that want to go through sort of non-digital non non-digital routes as well so that's a you know key, key part of of what we do um involving patients Patients who are less digitally literate, also patients who speak other languages, patients who have accessibility needs, um, all of that. Um, but yeah, there is no one size that fits all. Thank you very much. I think. Did you want to come in there? You can have your hand up. You are very. And uh, take out the need for a doctor at all. So, so Dave and I were talking about this earlier, and I think we both share the, the, the same view, which is that, um, I, I mean, I, I, I don't think it's, I don't, personally don't think it's possible, you know, who, who knows what's possible with tech in you know, decades time, but I don't think it's what we want, you know, so much of care delivery is understanding those nuances, build, building those relationships, things like that. Where I think it is really valuable is in, in moving to an asynchronous world. Um, streamlining things like taking a history or things like, okay, this patient's got back pain, right, here are, the, you know, here are the 12 questions to ask, but actually keeping the clinician in the driving seat. So to take an analogy, you know, if you look at uh, you know, moving towards self-driving cars, which I think is going to be a lot easier than moving towards uh, you know, self-diagnosing bots, where, where things are now is actually what we call like driver assistance, you know, things that help Tell you if you've gone out of your lane or if you're going to hit the car in front but actually you're still driving the car and i think that's that's the world we want to support where clinicians are still you know very much in control ultimately like i've tried all these you know ai bots and things if i go through and it tells me i don't need medical care and i think i do i'm still going to contact a clinician i still you know even if the quality of decision is better through through that algorithm i still want to speak to speak to a person be it face to face over the phone through messaging um, and I think maybe that's a cultural shift that will happen over time, but certainly with sort of what we know today, I think clinicians are very much going to stay in the driving seat and keep that, those, you know, that continuity of care, that individual interactions that's like the sort of bedrock of, of general practice. Thank you very much. I mean, that gives us a lot of food for thought. We're going to have to stop this session now. I think we've gone a long time, but we have to move on because we've got a tight timetable. Many thanks um, for that. Um, again... It, if you want to, we'll swap around in a minute, but just to say that uh, I think it's a great time uh, that this question about 
human engagement of uh, uh, patients and the public is absolutely at the core and heart of I think, what the Academy is trying to do. Through COVID, we've had people engaged. Um, then you, I think you can speak to us on that. Um, uh, uh, with all the projects we've been, been involved with, led particularly by, uh, by our communications team, and, um, and we've really had strong engagement with, um, the, with public and with uh, patients helping us. You, you'll be hearing from them shortly, and it's absolutely clear that this public, in public involvement and co-production is absolutely critical to everything we do. And actually, in our next session, our first speaker will indeed be um, uh, will be a, a recovery trial participant. So, if I can ask you to move back, we'll stop the names. Now. No, is it possible to just open that door? If not, I think we'll get to. And so, while everybody's moving around, I'm going to um, um, welcome our next speakers to the come to the front. And first of all, um, we're going to talk about clinical trial innovation during COVID-19. And the first person to speak to us will be Kimberly Featherston, who's been a recovery trial participant, followed by Professor Pat Tunery, who's Professor of Neurology and Head of Department at Clinical, Neuro Clinical Neurosciences in Cambridge, and has actually been chairing the national core studies on clinical trials. So Kimberly, if I can ask you to stop, sorry, to stand up, sit down, one of the um, to get the choreography right, over to you. Good afternoon. Um, so I've been asked to speak about the impact that being part of the recovery trial had on my experience of the pandemic and my recovery. Uh, back at the beginning of the pandemic, which I suppose for those of us not involved in healthcare was around mid-March last year, I spent some time regretting some of my life choices, having gone into education rather than nursing like my sister did. This was because I had a constant feeling that there was some, must be something I could do, and I really wanted to do something to help, whether that was helping patients or helping people that were helping patients. But I didn't have any relevant experience or qualifications, so I stayed at home and saved lives like we were told to do. Being allowed back into school, as I worked in a school, <laughs> obviously, um, with, to work with children face-to-face -face was a relief, but I considered it to be a matter of when I got COVID rather than if. It finally caught up with me just in time for October half term last year. As a natural born optimist, I spent 10 days telling myself everything was going to be fine until the oxygen saturations proved otherwise and I ended up admitted. It was around that time that I remembered an article I'd read about two rather smart gentlemen discussing the imminent wave of infection heading our way on the bus on the way to work. As I took my morning cup of pills, I remembered they quickly discovered how effective dexamethasone was and the mouth made it standard treatment for COVID in patients. <clears throat> I was immensely grateful and felt lucky to be experiencing COVID seven months into the whole thing with more treatment options available. I can't imagine how terrifying it must have been to be one of the first wave. I'd been a guest at my local hospital for a couple of days before a doctor came to my cubicle with a handful of paper and a look of trepidation. She said she couldn't speak to me about a medical trial that was going on. And before she got much further than that, I eagerly agreed to be whatever the kind of guinea pig she needed me to be. She clearly wasn't used to this level of enthusiasm, particularly from somebody who couldn't get to the end of a sentence without desaturating. Off she went to randomise me into one of the trial groups. Whilst I went through the information, I was most intrigued by the monoclonal antibody treatment as I'd not heard of them before. And it just so happened that that was where I ended up. I'll never be able to say definitively whether they are what turned things around for me. All I can say is I went from feeling pretty unwell and that this charge was a way off to feeling like I was on the way to doing a bit better. And it wasn't that I suddenly felt completely fine, but I felt like I turned a corner and was on an upwards trajectory. One thing that stood out to me through my, my experience as a trial in a hospital was that it was all done by a small bunch of people who were clearly there purely to deal with the trial. It wasn't a case of overworked nurses, doctors and healthcare assistants or surgeons um, trying to do it alongside looking after patients. This was what they were there for and that enabled them to put everything into it. Finally, I felt like I'd been able to contribute in some way. And it's not that I went out of my way to get COVID to be able to do that. <laughs> I went home and didn't really give much thought to where my data had gone and what it was doing. A couple of months later, I responded to a call out for people who'd been on the trial. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to get a drink of water. <laughs> No, no, it's fine. 
I re a couple of months later, I responded to a call out for people who'd been on the trial to give some feedback that might help with recruitment for the trial in the future. This put me in touch with a lady called Caroline at Oxford University. And it seems I must have made an impression on her as I've been her go-to girl for all things recovery related ever since. I had the honor of speaking on a webinar for recovery's first birthday alongside um, Sirs Peter Horby and Martin Landre. And it was Caroline passing my information on to the Academy that has led me here today. The highlight of my pandemic experience, apart from still being here, um, was when in June, it was announced that monoclonal antibodies were extremely effective against severe COVID. I was asked for new quotes for the press and told to keep it quiet, so I didn't even tell my kids. This led to my 14 year old daughter getting up one morning, doing her usual check of the BBC app and seeing a photo of me alongside the headline, another life-saving COVID treatment found. <laughs> If you've never Googled yourself, I can highly recommend it, as at first glance, it looks like I am the treatment. <laughs> <laughs> Being part of recovery has led me to become a patient ambassador for research at Calderdale and Huddersfield Trust, where I hope to be able to encourage others to take part in medical research. When I'm asked why I was so eager to take part in recovery, my answer is very simple. One, I love science and I trust science. Two, I trust the NHS completely. And three, somebody has to do it. We all want better, better cancer treatments, better cold and flu remedies, better contraceptives. And for that, research has to happen. Someone somewhere has to put their faith in science and just do it. I'm more than happy to be one of those people, even happier to be in a room full of those who have a hand in research. So I can say face to face, I think you're amazing. I trust you and thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Let me take you back to the BC era, where BC, of course, is before COVID-19, and then take one step further forward to January 2020, when the mainstream press was reporting the first case of COVID-19 in the UK, and it became the focus of media attention. And this was a new disease, the mechanisms of which we did not understand. We did not understand its natural history. There were no treatments. There were no biomarkers apart from measuring viral load. And we were seeing that it was starting to have substantial morbidity, particularly in high risk groups. There was an emerging public health crisis. And our community, our clinicians, our researchers across the country responded vigorously uh, in an exceptional way, facilitated by the work of our funding agencies, the National Institute for Health Research and the Medical Research Council. And what this graph shows you is it shows you the uh, weekly COVID uh, um, incident cases mapped onto an extraordinarily rapid response from the funding agencies and, and our community to come up with creative new ideas to understand and treat this condition and for this to be uh, peer reviewed and funded within weeks never been seen before, extraordinary, and continued uh, throughout uh, the first six months of last year. Now, this led to a number of research studies being carried out, including in the therapeutic space. And by Easter 2020, uh, things were being assembled uh, quite nicely. On first impression, we'd seen the enthusiastic work uh, from industry in partnership with some of our academic institutions to develop a vaccine programme. We've heard about the recovery platform that was funded uh, in that period of time, and also existing platforms such as the Remap Cap Intensive Care Study, which was repurposed uh, to address the COVID-19 challenge. And the community study principle also led out of Oxford, which was focused prior to that time on respiratory illnesses, which turned towards the COVID direction. And we were starting to explore the idea of having long COVID studies, post-hospitalization studies, prophylaxis. Now this all happened within weeks. And as a consequence, it created a rather fragmented landscape with gaps. Uh, because this had been a grassroots up approach, uh, there was no coherent treatment portfolio. And we actually saw competition for resources, not just financial resources, but resources such as recruiting sites in clinical trials, and indeed access to possible participants in, in uh, clinical studies of the nature that we've just heard about. The rate of recruitment was extremely good, given the fact that the NHS was focused on healthcare delivery, 
but we realized it could be better. It was patchy, both in time and in place. And we saw that some unexpected sites, particularly district general hospitals, were doing exceptionally well, whereas other sites were not recruiting as fast to these national trials. And finally, we were relying largely on drugs that we already knew about, repurposed drugs. We didn't have a development pipeline, at least in the academic context. And so it was realized that this needed some form of reconfiguration and reorganization. The Government Office for Science led the way with the funders to try and address this. And so within a matter of three months, things changed dramatically. And by December 2020, the nationally funded platforms from phase one studies where new medicines were first being tried in man, through phase two studies, which were testing uh, a larger portfolio of agents for evidence of efficacy of mechanism and ensuring that they were safe in participants with COVID-19, through to the big definitive phase three studies that I've already alluded to. And we also saw activity in the prophylaxis space. In other words, what preventative medicines could we give to people at high risk uh, from developing complications of COVID and also started to think about the long COVID challenge. And so what is it that we've learned about uh, clinical trials through this activity throughout 2020? Well, we've learned two main things in my view. One is that if you're gonna assemble a national platform uh, that is served in the whole country and, and being supported by the whole sector, you need to have an impartial approach to how you identify candidate drugs to feed into that uh, in order to avoid duplication and make sure you get to the best agents in the fast possible time. And, and this is why, uh, uh, the ch uh, Chief Medical Officer for England asked us to set up the COVID-19 Therapeutic Advisory Panel. And the key point about this is it was transparent and open, and it was focused on prioritizing drugs, not rejecting them, working out which were the best ones at that time that we should be trialing. It had an open web portal on the Department of Health and Social Care website, so anybody, a layperson, academia, industry, could nominate a candidate. There were eight people, some of whom are here today, uh, who were involved in the uh, full uh, panel of experts that looked at the evidence and took advice from a number of expert subgroups focused on important disease mechanisms that we thought were going to be important to treat in COVID-19. It was all serviced by uh, an, a uh, highly skilled due diligence team, which was rapidly seconded from the NHS industry and our universities to carry out the detailed scanning for information in the public sector and in the private sector to advise these subgroups about efficacy and likely treatment effects. And these subgroups advised the main CTAP panel, which made recommendations to all of the trial platforms we've discussed through uh, Chris Whitty and the trial investigators. Over the year, we looked at uh, 355 submissions, of which 228 were unique, and we produced detailed briefings on over 100 of those uh, which allowed us to make 30 recommendations into trials. This was all done virtually, and the, and the seven subgroup meetings met 47 times, and the CTAP main panel met usually out of hours uh, about 16 times in that year, so that we could go through this information and continually re revise the prioritized list as slots became available in the trials when recruitment was fast. This led to seven uh, drugs being recommended for NHS care and over 50,000 participants, one of whom is on my right, were recruited into these studies. It was genuinely national effort. It was diverse in terms of its representation across all four uh, administrations, and we involved scientists across the whole country and many uh, around the world. The second key learning point was the urgent public health prioritization process, which was put in place by the National Institute for Health Research and chaired by Nick Lemoyne. This is essentially a way of working out which studies were most likely to have impact on COVID-19 and therefore should be supported by the National Clinical Research uh, Network. Uh, you could apply and these were reviewed uh, rapidly within, within a week or so. Uh, the studies were identified as being a priority and the CRN worked with the investigators to expedite uh, recruitment into those studies and delivery with sharing of the information and 101 studies were designated through this process. So what are the six lessons that I think we've learned from this? I think what this has shown us is that at a time of a pandemic you need coordination and leadership to be efficient and effective and get answers that can have a benefit for the NHS and patients. 
You need to do this in a transparent way, which is independent and agile, responding to new data as and when it becomes uh, available. Open data sharing is key. And the reason for this is because transparency and visibility engages stakeholders and builds public confidence. And data sharing of NHS data has been pivotal to the lessons we've learned through recovery, for example. As we've heard, embedding the trial within the NHS allowed trial delivery at scale, but it also led to implementation, often within days of a trial result being released. And having a coordinated staged approach where each part of the sector understands what the previous part is going to deliver and allows it to pull through fast also accelerates the rate at which you can advance your understanding and do this at scale and keep it as simple as you possibly can. So it raises the provocative question as to whether or not we should be doing this beyond COVID-19. Should we be identifying priority areas beyond infection, beyond the pandemic, where this approach might work? And this is a question, an open question, which we, we may be able to discuss. I think key elements to this are that we need to understand the disease. We need to think about natural history from the outset. We need to think about centrally coordinating these trials across the whole landscape from uh, first in man through to pivotal uh, therapeutic phase three and phase four trials. We need a single system if we're gonna do this at a national level to prioritize the best treatments and that needs a skilled team. Um, and we all have to agree what the rules of engagement are between each stage of the trial platform. That is not straightforward and was something we had to spend a lot of time working on. We have to work in partnership with the regulators, particularly uh, the MHRA and the HRA, uh, and, and critically ask ourselves what the risks are in our trial designs and what the risks might be if we tightly regulate those and therefore inhibit research from happening. This is a nuanced balance that we need to constantly think carefully about in order to accelerate progress in medical discovery in this space. And we've got to work with the commercial sector and co-design this platform so that we're open for business to work with them so that we can trial the most exciting medicines that are coming out of the commercial pipeline. And finally, we need capacity building. Uh, many of our researchers were NHS uh, clinicians during the COVID-19 pandemic, and they've returned to their normal duties now. So what are the perceived risks? Of course, this is not without risk. There are concerns that if you create pl platforms such as this, you're creating a cartel and that might stifle innovation um, and it may prevent challenge. You run the risk that you could have geographic or demographic restrictions in how you do your trials. And by prioritizing some areas, inevitably you're deprioritizing others. But I believe these three areas can be addressed um, if resourced appropriately and constructed in a way that fully engages the whole community and the benefits. Well, we need to do this in a UK-wide manner involving the devolved administration so we can deliver this at scale. We can improve the health of the nation, as we've heard throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, and some of the treatments will be cheap, so we'll reduce NHS costs. Embedding it within the NHS and sharing data will lead to efficiencies in delivery, and we can show the world that we are global leaders in this, not just in delivering trials, but in how to deliver trials. This will, I anticipate, lead to inward investment, as we've seen with large pharma coming to join our platforms and put their medicines into our platforms. And it also presents us with an opportunity to respond to the next challenge that we don't know about in our preparations for the unknown. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for two wonderful talks, one who's been so involved in delivering the platforms and one who's been such an amazing participant, because without those people, we obviously cannot make progress. So we're going to have another two brief talks and then we'll have time for further discussion. So now we're going to talk about arming the nation against COVID-19 vaccine development and rollout. And it's a great pleasure to, in, to introduce Dr. Wasim Bani. Do you want to come up to um, join us? He's a junior doctor in Northwest England, and he's a member of the National COVID Response Group in the British Islamic Medical Association. And Dr. Melanie Saville, Director of Vaccine Development, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, or CEPI. So over to you, um, Dr. Bani, do you want to uh, come up and uh, start off and then uh, Dr. Saville can follow you?
Thank you for the introduction. Um, first of all, I wanted to say, hello, my name is Wasim, and I'm quite amazed, thrilled, and humbled to be here as a ju junior doctor. And I think it's fitting to say the term standing on the shoulder of giants, um, because whilst the pandemic may be a checkpoint in your medical careers for a lot of you, it was very much the start of my career as being a doctor. And I think the term christening by fire comes to mind. Um, and I can say that if I can achieve a fraction of what those in this room and Sir Colin Dory achieved, I'd con consider myself quite content. Um, so how did I end up becoming part of a national COVID response group at such a young age? Um, well, the pandemic really was at its peak whilst I was a final year medical student. And I remember being on my community placement in general practice um, and a patient came in with a learning disability and um, this patient wasn't making eye contact and they were very difficult to approach by the GP and the GP asked them, have you had your COVID vaccine? And it turned out she had missed her flu jab vaccine for a year, let alone the COVID vaccine. Um, and it got me thinking about that particular um, group of patients which had health needs. And I asked my GP, can I do something to try and improve this? Um, and I'd like to thank my supervisor at the time, Dr. Cranefield, for trusting me. And he essentially said, Wasim, if you think it's something that needs to be tackled, I'll support you. Um, and then I was shocked to see the evidence that learning disability patients their peak life expectancy is around 50 to 59, 60. Um, whereas a normal person such as you and I, it's probably closer to 80 without these conditions. And it's easy to say, yes, these patients have very difficult diseases and um, it's because of their comorbidities that they're dying. But if you actually look at the literature, a lot of it's avoidable deaths and they kind of slip through the cracks and whatnot. Um, and I thought COVID was one of those things that could be that. And I was glad to see at the time that the government had pushed the incentive and they put learning disability individuals into what I believe was an at-risk group. It was group six or something. Um, and there's a very important thing that and I think the charity MenCup you may have heard of, they push a lot. And I think it applies to a lot of things. And it's the idea of reasonable adjustments. And it was just, if something can be done very easily to make someone more approachable or more content with what you're presenting, it should be done. Whether that's a learning disability patient self-discharging from a very important hospital and you ask them it's because they haven't got their favorite DVD, just addressing that. And I think I, that applied very well and we managed to get the vaccine uptake in that area from something like 50% to 88%, which was very good to see. And then I found myself presenting it regionally to GPs and telling them where to improve, which was quite immense. So coming to the British Islamic Medical Association, I thought this work that I've done, it can contribute to the um, BAME community, because as we all know, that was a very big at-risk group during COVID. So what's the kind of work that we did? Um, so as you know, like we are quite blessed to live in a multicultural society. And I think many of you would agree the NHS is a fantastic representation of ethnic diversity and working together for the good of others. Um, but something like COVID, not through prejudice was more or less detrimental to certain individuals. And we at the British Islamic Medical Association identified this quite early and we realized that it's something that needed to be tackled. So one of the things that we did was during the peak vaccination rollout, it was during the holy month of Ramadan and a lot of Muslims were very apprehensive of taking the vaccine because it could break their fast. So we reached out to scholars internationally and to Public Health England um, and we released a statement um, saying that it does not omit your fast, you can take the vaccine. And if you do become unwell, then yes, that's a reason. But if you don't, you can carry on as usual. Um, but then essentially, 
what we, like I said, the reasonable adjustments for those who were still apprehensive. We created a vaccine program that you could go out of hours after you broke your fast. So not to be like, if they don't want to do it, that's on them, but to actually create reasonable adjustments. And this is just one of the few other things that we did. So misinformation, we would, um, we started doing a lot of translations for people and things like that. Um, and just Q and A's and things like that. And then also helping practitioners. So like in ICU, those who wear hijabs just to help with them. And then for foundation doctors. Um, and then just lastly, mental well-being as well. And I think that's very important. Um, but to summarize, what I'm trying to say is that sometimes these kind of adjustments need to be made and it's not always about equality, but it's about equity. And sometimes we need to address that. And there's a very important quote that I, I saw the other day and it was from John Dewey, a psychologist in the early 20th century, a philanthropist and what, leader of what we now call pragmatism, which I think is very relevant. And he said, we don't learn from experiences, but we learn from reflection of experiences. And I think that was very important. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for inviting me um, to speak. Um, so I'm Melanie Savile, I'm Director of Vaccine Research and Development with CEPI, uh, an organization that was specifically set up from a global perspective following the Ebola outbreak in West Africa in 2014, 2016, where despite years of research in vaccine development, there was no vaccine readily available. Uh, so our mission is really to, um, to um, prevent epidemics and pandemics from being a global threat in the future. And with that then our mission to accelerate vaccine development against emerging infectious diseases. And the way that we work is through partnerships um, and obviously very important partnerships being with academia, with industry, with regulators amongst others uh, to fund the development for vaccines. So our approach was to uh, fund and facilitate vaccine development um, for priority pathogens, MERS, another coronavirus, Lassa, Nipah, chikungunya, Rift Valley fever, and also fund development for rapid response platforms such as mRNA um, to look for potential use in future epidemics and pandemics when obviously in 2020, our disease X, our next pandemic um, hit. And in that regard, really, I think our life really changed as an organization at that point, as an organization that was to respond to an epidemic or pandemic. And the very first thing that we did was really build on the knowledge base that we already had. And in this case, funding development from MERS vaccines already gave us a number of learnings on coronaviruses, together with working on rapid response platforms so we were in a position by the 23rd of January, 2020, that we announced our first three partnership agreements for development of COVID-19 vaccines, which included Moderna, CureVac, and University of Queensland. And through 2020, through calls for proposal, developing one of the largest portfolios of vaccines uh, against COVID-19, across a number of platforms supporting 14 vaccines in development. Uh, obviously, um, Moderna, Oxford, AstraZeneca being now administered to hundreds of millions, if not billions of people around the world and other candidates such as Novavax and Clover with efficacy data available. And we hope a licensure of those vaccines very shortly. As well as specifically looking at developing vaccines, there are a number of important enablers around vaccine development that need to be considered. Harmonization of assays for evaluating vaccines is critical. And we have a network of laboratories, including laboratories in the UK, that any developer, and there are hundreds of developers around the world, can send samples to test in immunological assays so we can compare apples with apples across the various developments. 
Also some investments in tracking variants and looking at the biological relevance of variants as they emerge to vaccine efficacy through looking at immunological assays and early animal work to see the potential impact on vaccines. And as we're moving forward, looking at more broadly protective vaccines against uh, COVID-19, but also coronaviruses as a virus family. We we'll also recognize the need that um, people have moved fast to getting to emergency use authorization, but there's a lot of evidence gaps from a clinical perspective and filling those evidence gaps specifically with clinical trials. And as an example, we've been working with the UK on mix and match regimens for vaccines to look at how they can be used in the future. And last, but by no means least, looking at manufacturing specifically, um, we've moved from an R&D organization to an organization funding very large scale up of manufacturing, identifying bottlenecks in manufacturing that will impact supply and um, generation of a marketplace so we can bring manufacturers together with uh, the raw materials. And all of this is also built around something that is fundamental to what CEPI does, and that is equitable access to vaccines. So then our contracts Developers have to um, give us first rights to vaccines um, to be used in a global fair allocation system now um, called COVAX. And you can see here through the COVAX mechanism, we have CEPI, Gavi, WHO uh, working with UNICEF to deliver vaccines around the world. And we've delivered over half a billion vaccines to 144 countries around the world. We're not in the equitable space at this point, high income countries still have delivered far more vaccines than low and middle income countries. And we really still need to work on these to ensure that we get to equity around the world. And maybe just a few reflections there. I, there's a lot there that I've presented. And this is all the work of industry, academia. The work of the regulators has been tremendous. And what has happened is something really extraordinary. Vaccine development usually takes at least a decade. And what we have seen is to the first results being available from clinical trials from the sequence, only 300, just over 300 days. So the first doses were delivered when there were 68 million cases of COVID around the world. So we have a challenge. What if you could convert that 300 days to 100 days when there are only 2.3 million cases of COVID in the world? What impact would have introducing vaccines had in that circumstance? So with that in mind, just to say that we have some plans moving forward to really look at that and prepare already for the next pandemic. We know that COVID-19 is not over yet. Uh, and we're also, the importance of R&D still for COVID-19, looking at vaccines, second generation vaccines, vaccines that will be variant proof, perhaps vaccines that will be better at preventing transmission, as well as looking at broadly protective coronavirus vaccines that protect against known coronavirus, but we know that they are future coronavirus threats. Other important factors to consider we built our understanding on MERS, uh, SARS, together with rapid response platforms. Coronaviruses are just one of 25 or so virus families that infect humans. And there are many, many other families where the next pandemic epidemic could come from. So looking at virus families, what pose a threat and pretty much doing what had happened before COVID-19, developing vaccines with rapid response platforms in four viruses in those families, testing them already in humans and putting those in a library so that when the next pandemic hits, we have the information available to rapidly hit the ground running and to look then at our aspiration of 100 days. This can only all be done though if you look at connecting the whole community, the research community, all the way through to the delivery community, 
And it's critically important that we are better prepared with networks, for example, preclinical, clinical networks, but also look at the equity across the globe in terms of low and middle income countries and make sure that we can support all regions of the world uh, to develop their plans so that they can also respond to these outbreaks. I'd just like to finish though, this is a celebration of British research and development to the pandemic. And just to highlight, first of all, real thanks to, to the UK government for funding CEPI, as well as funding, obviously, um, a lot of work within the UK, funding for the world. And we have a number of key R&D partners in the UK, working with Oxford, AstraZeneca, um, Imperial College, importantly, good relationships and good projects with NIBSC, Public Health England, um, and we have a, a, a forum for regulatory discussions and we have MHRA um, as a very active participant in those fora to really look at how we can deal with the bottlenecks in development through COVID-19. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. It's done a couple of fantastic talks and many things we could discuss. We've got about uh, five or ten minutes for discussion now. So, um, other questions that people would like to uh, raise either online or in the room? Yeah, do you want to kick off the, with microphones behind you? My name is Susan Meekin. I'm a lawyer working in indemnity at Lloyd's, the biggest insurance market in the world. My question is to Professor Chinnery. I'm not sure if he can answer this. You talked about competition for resources. Um, were clinicians and researchers supplied with adequate information and access to a depth and spread of insurance and reinsurance? And if they were, were they also given access to good legal advice about avoiding moral hazard? And I'm thinking of the situation with the Novavax trial result where there was a hiatus in uh, the application to the regulator for a license. And uh, position of the clinical trial subjects in that hiatus and comments that were made that might be interpreted by lawyers in the insurance industry as raising the risk profile compared to the indemnity available. Yes. Patrick, do you want to yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah, fire away. Thank you, yes, really interesting question. So this was all done at an incredible pace within weeks um, and Nonetheless, it was still done within the governance frameworks which existed during peacetime, as it were. So in that sense, the regulation was in place uh, and the guidance was in place. I use the word resources in a very broad sense, not just fiscal resources, uh, but the resources that are required to conduct a clinical trial, which involves human resource, it involves participants wishing to engage uh, and interfacing that with uh, hospitals that were extremely stretched because they were delivering acute care. So, so that's what created the tension, I think, to some extent, uh, and the fact that it was done at pace. Jonathan. Yeah, Jonathan Shepherd. I'm a surgeon in Cardiff, and um, I'm a fellow of the Academy. Uh, another question for you, Patrick, if I, if I may. You talked about agility in implementation, and I wondered if you had any reflections on Kate Bingham's comments uh, this week, um, mainly about the civil service, about risk aversion, um, inertia because of process, lack of understanding of scientific method, uh, and, and particularly what might be done if you agree that those are reasonable criticisms of, of government. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was on a train when she gave a radio in great detail. Um, you know, I think we've all learned an enormous amount in the last year um, about how we might do things better. Um, that includes myself as a clinician and a scientist. And I think that also applies within the civil service. Um, you know, I'm hopeful that there have been lessons learned from that as to how we might approach the situation moving forward. Um, I, uh, you know, I think what I would say is, as a clinical scientist is that the more people that we can get into government and the civil service that understand science, the better. And that will put us in a better, better shape moving forward. But you can't do that kind of thing overnight. Any comments from the rest of the panel on either of those two points you want to come forward to? Are there other questions in the room? Yeah, uh, Tom. 
and do uh, put things on chat if you've got questions, Tom. Uh, thanks, Tom Toleman in Liverpool. I have a question for uh, Kimberly. Um, you mentioned the uh, a handful of paperwork or the mountain of paperwork you were presented with when you were considering going into the trial. Do, do you think we have got it right or do we give people masses of paperwork to reassure us and it's not really fair what we actually give people to, to, to try and make sense of at that kind of time? I see your point. Um, it was definitely a handful rather than a mountain, so not maybe as much as, it, <laughs> as you might have thought, but uh, it was a maybe five, six sheets of paper and I, I imagine that if somebody didn't feel comfortable or able to read all that and to digest it, that the doctor would have happily explained it. And she was, I, mean, I had to stop her from wasting her time explaining it to me because I'd already knew quite a lot about it and, I'd, um, and I was more than capable of reading it. So I feel that if, if I hadn't been in that situation, then we would have happily sort of um, catered to someone who needed to be told all the information. It's Gemma. Thanks very much. My question is to Wasim. Um, you, you showed a lot of work that you did to try and make sure that the Muslim community in your local area were able to take up the COVID vaccine and keep themselves COVID safe. But my question is, don't you think that kind of work should be mainstreamed, should be a part of the provision of the NHS? And this refers to all communities, including you were talking about people with learning difficulties, find it difficult to access care. Shouldn't we pay attention to trying to make sure that these marginalized communities, as it were, are actually able to access the care they need by making sure that these initiatives are mainstream? We saw what happened during the COVID pandemic, how we had more deaths uh, for Bangladeshi males and black uh, females and males dying of COVID. I just wonder what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um... I think first it's saying, I don't think by no means we're where we should be, but it takes a few people to make a big difference. And I think from this, there has been changes to national guidelines. A lot of the paperwork for COVID, like you said, we managed to basically, I guess, give a gentle push that it needs to be multilingual. Like there's a lot of people in this country where, although they can understand, speak English, it's the, I guess, medical jargon, which needs to be translated. And if you, you don't know what you don't know, essentially. Um, but I think, um, yeah, I think definitely it, it, there needs to be a bigger prioritization. But like um, Patrick said, if you, when you over prioritize something, something else sometimes under prioritizes and that's just the issue with something that's finitely resourced. But it's definitely, like I said earlier, it's about the equity rather than equality. Like in this pandemic, it showed that we desperately needed priority vaccination programs for a certain group. So like older individuals or BAME individuals before we did a national rollout. And those things, there needs to be people who are representative of those societies in areas where such rules and regulations are made. I think that's probably what's needed. Yeah. Okay. So, a question from Dr. Dorry. You got the uh, microphone to the front here. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, fine. There we go. Thank you. Um, I was trying to say this before Patrick arrived. Um, you really showed that the response to COVID has, a, above anything, been a team game and that bringing people together has made the difference. But I think it's important that we also say we had incredible leadership in, at the top of the shop. And having a chief medical officer who is an expert in infectious diseases and epidemiology and a chief scientific officer who is a clinician scientist with direct experience of drug development in industry, I think has put this country in an entirely different position. And I wonder if you could just reflect on how we retain those qualities for the challenges of the future. Who'd like to deal with that? Patrick. I agree. I agree with the comments that you made entirely, and uh, um, kind of reflects partly on the comment I made earlier about the importance of having more scientists in positions of authority uh, in government and in civil service moving forward. So I agree. 
So one last very quick question, um, which is from Anna Dominicia, who is on the line. Um, question, I'm afraid it's to Patrick again. Well, I'm not afraid, but it is to you, Patrick. <laughs> Past publishing is good, but publishing in the popular media might not. Can you discuss? Any of you might want to discuss that about um, the relationship with the media versus the science media. Yeah, I'm not, in, in what frame? I'm not entirely sure which Well, frame fast publishing is good, but publishing in the popular media might not. I think it's a question about where the results are coming. Over to you. Here we are. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, what, what we have seen often, all of us, I think, is the first thing that you see about, certainly from the vaccine perspective, results are in the media um, before you get any scientific peer review. And that can be really challenging. I think there are some very responsible companies who have, with, for example, with any um, press release, given some really good scientific data with it or made attempts to at least pre have preprints um, available. So you can actually review the value of the data, but it, it is really difficult to, to really assess the, the the, the quality, the true value of the data when things are coming out in the media. And I think the other thing that has been really challenging that I've never really seen before is safety signals first coming out in, in, in the media as, as, you know, something happening in a clinical trial. Um, and that is really difficult to, um, to address because you often don't know the context of that. Um, but so, so it is really challenging, but I, I think the way forward is as much transparency in terms of the data that is available, making data public in, um, in preprints and, and organizations making as much data available as possible um, so, that, so that people can be best informed and not um, misinterpret any data. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think that's a great note to stop. We're a few minutes over time, but I, I know you wanted some time to discuss. We're now going to have a, a brief break, and be a very brief break, be back by uh, five to four, so it gives you about 10 minutes. And what better point to stop to say that one of the great communicators and leaders in the pandemic is with us in the room, Patrick Valance, who will be introducing and chairing the next session. Thanks very much to you all for participating and to our speakers. Thank you. I'm sorry.
Don't worry. Thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure. To speak at this meeting under the name of Colin Dollery, who was such an influential figure in British medicine and certainly Thank was you. very influential well, a great in my career and incredibly supportive in all sorts of ways and uh, a fount of knowledge and is the sort of person who you definitely need on a, on a day like this and he's missed um, by many people across medicine and uh, has influenced I think more than one generation of doctors so great pleasure to be here for that reason alone. Um, I wanted to say a few words about science and the pandemic and lessons learned. The first thing to say is science is getting us out of this and that's the important and obvious statement. But science has been important right the way through, and it's been important for understanding the disease, for monitoring, tracking, and detecting, for the response to the disease, and of course, for giving policy advice. And I want to just say a few words about each of those, and then I've got a fantastic panel here, and I think we've got Kamnish Kunti on, on mine as well, who will appear, and they're going to do most of the work in saying what their contributions and observations are on the lessons learned. But if I th take those four headings, very early on, so in January 2020, uh, we pulled together the research funders and said, we've got to do something here to try and have a more joined up approach to thinking about research funding as this disease emerges at that time of course it was in China and hadn't left China but that initial set of meetings which included all of the major research funders covered many areas which then turned out to be incredibly important for the way in which the disease was understood there quickly to try and address those problems. So I think there's some real interesting lessons. And of course, that idea that multiple sciences need to come together is exactly at the heart of this academy and what this academy does. It's not an academy for only clinician scientists. It's an academy for all of the sciences that come together to meet the needs of medicine and medical approaches right the way across the spectrum. So understanding. The second was monitoring, tracking, and detecting. And I just want to call out a few things here, which I think were particularly important. I think the early funding and collaboration between uh, the genomics community was incredibly important. So um, you're probably aware that at um, one point, over 50% of all the viral genomes in the world have been sequenced in the UK. And that's because academics came together institutes like the Sanger Center and others to make sure that we had a really good sequencing capability. And of course that sequencing capability has been very important to pick up the inevitable variants that emerge and will be incredibly important going forward. The second uh, one I pick up in terms of the monitoring detecting would be the Office for National Statistics survey, which is week on week and the REACT study actually from Imperial, week on week taken samples to try to understand what is actually happening. Now, until that was in place, it was very difficult to get a handle on how many cases there were, which age groups they were infecting, which uh, direction the, the, the uh, pandemic was going in. But the Office for National Statistics set up a good unbiased sampling strategy right the way across the UK. It remains absolutely crucial for understanding what goes on, and indeed is something that many other countries look to, to try and understand the course of the pandemic. And so great kudos to that organization for doing that. And there are other areas as well, um, including the immunology and the ability to start to understand what antibody responses do and don't mean, how they change over time. And that's clearly important now in terms of thinking about waning immunity and the importance of making sure that we can boost, um, boost immunity. And then response and response again, you know, it's invidious to pick out things, but I, I will do, because there are some that sort of stand out as obvious examples where science really became crucially important. And the 
very obvious one early on was the recovery study, which was set up as a simple pragmatic trial to allow testing of multiple compounds in hospitalized patients with COVID. And there were other trials as well going on as well, which have been important in what they've given. But I, I just mentioned the recovery study because at the peak of the first wave, something like 11% of all patients in hospital with COVID were enrolled in the recovery study. That is an extraordinary achievement. Normally in clinical trials, you look at the eligible patient population and the enrollment's 1% or something, if you're lucky. So to get 11% of all patients, and it's a testament actually to the NHS and everyone working in the NHS, that they were able to do this during the time of extraordinary pressure. And that study was the first really that showed something that really did work, dexamethasone. And just as importantly, it showed things that didn't work. Things that were being widely touted as treatments that they could show did not have an effect. And it's gone on, of course, to show other things that worked. So the recovery trial, I think, was incredibly important, as indeed were the other clinical trial programs. But the recovery trial is one of the few across the world that was appropriate size, appropriate design to be able to give really clear answers. I'll pick out the vaccines task force as something that immediately understood that um, the ability to get vaccines was not dependent only on a procurement process. It needed science, it needed manufacturing, it needed the R&D of manufacturing, it needed people who understood about portfolio choices, and as Seppi said, they were early in trying to get this sorted out. That was an important part of preparedness, and it's a lesson there about what the UK needs to do in terms of its own infrastructure to be able to do this, because our vaccine industry was not in the place it should have been at the beginning of this pandemic. And more recently, the Antivirals Task Force, which set itself an ambition of getting two antivirals by the end of the year, actually looks like that could be possible, um, clearly to bring that from the companies that have done such a great job. And the working between academia and industry was crucially important in both of those. And then the final thing in recovery, in, in um, response, which I'll just mention, is the national core studies, which I know Patrick Chinnery talked about earlier, earlier on, and he was absolutely instrumental in these, to bring together the things that we really needed to get science applied to the big questions that government, society, and everybody had at that time. And so the ability to bring people together was extraordinary during this time. And I think there are lessons there about how research could be organised at other times when there are questions that we need to tackle together and the obvious one that faces us all is obviously the climate challenge and so I think there are lessons there about organization. Um, the the um, third, fourth area then is, is thinking about um, science for policy and there there have been lots of mechanisms across government the one that um, became a sort of a unifying place for lots of this but certainly not all of the science advice was SAGE which was a way to bring multidisciplinary teams around the table to try to give advice on specific areas of um, policy uh, that were needed. So the job of SAGE is not to make the policy, not to try and direct the policy, but try to give the scientific basis so that policy can be informed by science. And again, what was crucial was the range of disciplines. And science does spread across all sorts of disciplines, and it's crucially important to have social sciences, humanities involved in this. And we can see that right the way across what SAGE had to do. So my three points that I want to stop with and then hand over to the panel are, if I think about what the lessons were that were crucial, as well as the things I've mentioned, international collaboration has been absolutely essential and remains essential, and information exchange internationally is crucial. Secondly, and I've mentioned interdisciplinarity, you don't solve problems by going to one discipline. You need multiple disciplines working together. And the third, and I want to um, you know, thank this academy for this, the way in which the learning societies and academies came together to try and give really good, independent, robust, high level scientific advice was fantastic. And this academy, produced two crucial reports, one on the first winter, one on the, this winter, on what might happen that have been hugely influential across government. The Royal Academy of Engineering produced reports, including on um, safe buildings, and the British Academy produced reports on what society needed to think about post-COVID, and the Royal Society produced reports during the whole thing and lots of advice. So the academies really came into their own 
and were crucial. So I will stop there and say those are some of the things that I took in thinking about what we might do to pick up on some of those lessons going forward during post-pandemic time. Now, I'll go to the panel and ask everybody to briefly say a little bit about themselves and try and keep that brief, and then we'll go to uh, three to four minutes from each one to give their observations. So, Lynn, do you want to? Thank you. Hi, thank you. My name is Lynn Laidlaw, and I live with a rare autoimmune rheumatic disease and multiple long-term conditions, and was deemed extremely clinically vulnerable and was required to shield throughout the pandemic. So I'm here because I'm a patient and public contributor to research. I was co-chair of the patient and carer reference group in, in the preparing for the, the future report. And because of that, I sat in the expert advisory group as well. I'm a patient researcher and I'm co-producing a small piece of qualitative research with another patient researcher, Joyce, and the clinical academic, Charlotte, into people with autoimmune rheumatic diseases, experiences of shielding in the pandemic, which has been funded by Versus Arthritis. And I was also involved in a lot of COVID-19 research, including the COVID Immunology Consortium and the the British Heart Foundation Data Science Centre. It's just a bit about me. Thank, Thank you. you. June. Hi everyone, I'm June Rain. I lead the Medicines and Healthcare Products <laughs> Regulatory Agency, which is the UK's independent regulator, which ensures that vaccines, therapeutics and diagnostics work and are acceptably safe. And our role during the pandemic really has to demonstrate the importance of that independent scientific uh, second look that makes sure that the public has confidence in the way that decisions are made. So many challenges, particularly around transparency, but looking very much forward to messages for the future. Thank you, Najib. Yep, hi, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Najib, I'm an a &E consultant based up in Leeds, but I wear a couple of other hats. I've had about 20 years of experience in international humanitarian response and health development. I'm a trustee of a charity called Doctors Worldwide. I'm also a member of BEMA and have been involved in part of the founding discussions for the British Scientific Medical Association. And in the first few months of the pandemic, we founded an initiative called the Frontline Collaboration Against COVID-19, which is bringing in NHS frontline workers, NHS leaders and humanitarian furloughed experts to try and create rapid turnaround solutions for hospitals and frontline physicians and carers. So those are my few hats. Thank you. And uh, Kamlish, I don't know whether how you appear, if you do. Hi, Patrick. Can you, can you hear me? Uh, Patrick, can, can, you, can you hear me? Maybe what we'll do, if it's difficult to switch between formats, Hi. is to bring him on when... Oh, there we are, Kamlish. Can you hear me, Patrick? Can you just briefly introduce yourself, Kamlish? Uh, hi. Uh, hi. First of all, sincere apologies, I can't be with you. Apologies to you, uh, the Academy, and all, all the panel members and the audience that, that are there. Um, I'm Kamlish Kunti, I'm a general practitioner. Uh, I've been working in the area of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, but then over the last 18 months, been researched with a number of collaborators in the area of COVID and also um, sit on the SAGE and uh, um, chair the SAGE ethnicity sub panel. Thank you. Thanks, Kamlish. Right, let's hear statements from each of the panel members. Lynn, we'll start with you. Hi. So, as part of the um co-chair of the, the patient care reference group we wrote an annex to the winter pressures report called the people's perspective we were a diverse group with multiple different perspectives and interests but there was a few overarching themes which dominated our discussions and they were namely patient and public involvement in production communication and socioeconomic racial and health inequalities so my one lesson is to highlight to highlight um perhaps um understandably, is the importance of patient and public involvement throughout the pandemic and going forward as we reconfigure services and research. And the pandemic highlighted that patient public involvement was as, as embedded in research as we thought, because HR figures, HRA figures, um, showed us that pre-pandemic, 80% of research coming through the IRAS system to the RECs had patient public involvement, it fell to, and it fell to 20%. Yet, I believe that one of the successes of the pandemic was how communities worked together to overcome issues such as vaccine hesitancy. And for example, the way that people with long COVID, and this is, this is something we just didn't know about, organized themselves so rapidly to help research and to collect data ab about, about long COVID. And what I would like to say is that no one will care about research and services more than the people and the communities affected by diseases and issues such as inequalities. We live with the conditions and are affected by these issues and it gives us unique insight into what matters 
what outcomes are important and what good looks like in the context of our lives. If we didn't think that involving us would be beneficial, then we wouldn't waste researchers and clinicians' time. So I, and I don't think that anyone at the Academy of Medical Sciences would say that the patient and carer reference group detracted from the winter pressures report. And I really want to pay tribute to them for making the space for these challenging conversations, for forging relationships, and for enabling this collaboration. And I want to finish with a plea from the people's perspective. Work with us, work for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. And, and uh, you know, I echo the, you know, what you said about the Academy report and how important this was to have this patient involvement. So thank you. June. Our major learning from the pandemic was to become an enabling regulator, no longer a policeman or a watchdog, but a facilitator of access. And it has been a very profound change and I welcome the chance to speak briefly about it. We had been talking about innovative trial designs and introducing more innovative approaches to our work for a long time, but this was the catalyst and the call to arms. And therefore studies like recovery, the platform trials, now was the time to get them up and running. And our clinical trials unit worked super fast uh, cut our trial approval time down to about a third of what it had been. But the important aspect was the introduction of innovation and the taking of those risks. My key message, and as an independent regulator, perhaps it will surprise you, is the need for partnerships. Partnership working was key with NICE, with the NHS, and not just nationally, with international bodies too, such as the International Coalition of Medicines Regulatory Authorities. And through these partnerships, we ensured that the outputs of studies like recovery, recovery hit the ground, were introduced into patient care as soon as they were available. So partnerships that preserve independence of roles and responsibility is key to hitting that 100-day target for the future. Thank you. Thank you, June. I think we go to Kamlish now, and then we come to you, and June. Kamlish. Thanks, Patrick. I mean, we've learned a lot uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we've learned the patient groups who have been disproportionately affected, uh, particularly the deprived, uh, that the minority groups, um, male particip participants, and people with comorbidities. I think one of the learnings that came on early on from the pandemic was uh, the ethnic minority groups who were disproportionately affected. And we didn't have much data on that. Even within the trials that were being set up, uh, these data were not being collected uh, on a, a regular basis. Um, and as the trials started recruiting, um, it was evident that uh, ethnic minorities weren't participating despite they were being disproportionately affected. And uh, William went off, uh, phoned me and asked our team how we could help uh, recruit these participants. So, our group uh, from uh, the Centre for Ethnic Health uh, did enormous amount of work on a regular basis trying to get recruitment. Even after that, we were having difficulty getting uh, data on what proportion of participants were from different groups. And I think my plea would be that we do need to recruit a representative uh, portion of patients from all areas, but we also need to report by different uh, groups. So we normally report our results by age and sex, but I think reporting by ethnicity, uh, not just collecting data on ethnicity, but reporting by ethnicity, reporting by uh, such areas as deprivation, I think should become standard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kamnish. Najib. So I'm gonna take a slightly different take. So I said, I'm an a &E clinician and by default, it's been a very medical journey in terms of managing COVID. But from the humanitarian perspective, we flip the lens. This is really trying to say, how do we ensure healthcare access as a human right? Chakli is inherently about what the NHS is about. But there's loads of transferable lessons from the humanitarian sector, namely around really powerful coordination that involves multiple stakeholders and community representation, looking at minimum standards of response, what's acceptable across key panels of delivery, whether it be health or shelter, et cetera. And then how do we actually engage with communities? And it's that last bit that I want to kind of focus on a little bit. Um, we ended up as part of BEMA and as part of those kind of skill sets, recognizing quite early on that minoritized groups didn't really have access to what was happening in the scientific and medical field. And how did that information get translated across? 
through BMO, we conducted a survey called the Co <laughs> Community Opinions on Vaccine Issues and Decisions, COVID. And it was a knowledge attitude practice survey. So we did this in Leeds through three mosques. We did it in Nottingham, involving the Nottingham Councillor Mosque. We had probably about 700 respondents altogether of people's perspectives on COVID and the vaccine. Using that information, we were able to kind of design webinars, myth-busting kind of posters, really being accessible, coaching the imams and other community leaders on what, what were the issues and realities that were being faced and the challenges and perceptions that people were having. So I think even moving forward, that idea of where do we collaborate, coordinate, how do we creatively develop content with community engagement at its heart, how does that really serve us for the future? And that now brings us right back to where we are now, again, in very, very busy emergency departments. The expectations and how we manage those expectations, a lot of it's reliant on community engagement. And I'm not sure we've cracked that quite yet in terms of how do we reach out and serve our, our communities to make sure we're delivering the NHS we want. Thanks. Thank you very much. So I think four really important lessons there from the involvement of patients at all stages and really making sure that the needs of patients are heard. And after all, we're all going to be patients at some point, so that this is a crucial part of the process. June and the enabling regulator, which I think MHRA has been a shining example of this throughout the pandemic, really extraordinary. Camlesh on the need to make sure as we do studies and as we get data, that we truly represent the population, not parts of the population, and that we ensure that we've got the appropriate diversity. And, and Kamlesh was absolutely superb on SAGE in making sure that that uh, uh, was something that was taken into account at all times. And then, as Najib said, the realities of actually getting treatments, vaccines, and other things out across the country means that you need to know how to engage. You need to know what it is that's needed in order to reach people. You can have the best technology in the world. And if you can't get it out to the people that need it, it is completely pointless. And so I think four great lessons there. And now this turns over to you all to have a chance to ask the panel questions. Yes. In quite early. And my question is to you, June Rain, as, as chair of the regulator, a fantastic achievement, making sure that we had approvals happen really quickly. And I've got two questions. First of all, did you sacrifice other areas in order to mobilize staff towards the COVID agenda? That's the question one. And then how can we sustain that kind of momentum that you've generated within your organization? The second question is looking at the diversity issue. Will you be asking questions of clinical trial, phase three trial investigators around the diversity of participants, just to make sure that we do not have what we saw with COVID, where a significant proportion of people from a particular ethnic group are actually dying quite quickly, and it had nothing to do with socioeconomic status. Thank you. Well, thank you. Great questions. First one, did we sacrifice any areas? And I have to pay tribute to our staff. We're a well-resourced agency, but everybody went the extra mile. For the first time, we allocated public health priorities to the vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics that would be important to fight the pandemic. And so we did divert resources into that area, but we relied on that 110% commitment of our people to keep everything else moving. So that was really how it was done. Your point about can you keep that going is a key one. We are transforming our organization really to put a big focus on innovation. Since leaving the EU, we have had it in our minds very much to do that and to focus on an end-to-end -end pathway that perhaps doesn't achieve 100 days for everything, but really looks to take time out of the discovery to deployment um, uh, path. We're looking to reduce it by half. So I'm pleased that you'll hold me to account for that. Your last question is really important. We're working through with the Recovery, Resilience and Growth Initiative of DHSC to take trials to people. And it means using all the digital support, for example, to make sure you don't have to travel, because that can be an issue for uh, communities. 
and we want to make sure that we support recruitment through tools such as our clinical practice GP database, which is capturing data from one in five practices and actually maps across to the population of the UK. So it's a key priority. Watch this space, but we believe now we've got the tools to deliver. Thank you. Does anyone else want to come in on, on either of those questions? Kamla, you may want to come in on that point about phase three studies. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I, I think now there is an appetite to recruit uh, uh, um, representative participation, but we need to go well above and beyond the way we recruit at the moment. Um, sending letters through GB practices is not really a, a way to recruit uh, minority and deprived participants. And I'll just give you an example. We've been involved in a number of trials for many years. A European trial where uh, Cambridge and Leicester were taking part. Cambridge sends the same letter out from the GP practices to their pop, uh, population and they get a 40% response rate. We do the same in, in Leicester with an added uh, cover letter in different languages and we get a 5% response rate. Uh, recruiting participants through our routine methods uh, is not really adequate enough. We need to do a lot more. We talked about uh, inequalities and equity before, and we really need equity. And this is equity at a number of levels. Equity, first of all, uh, for people to understand how to recruit uh, 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 participants from different uh, regions and different uh, groups. Uh, I think the funders need to realize that it costs a lot more to recruit participants from uh, certain groups. And finally, methods. And the methods are working with the communities. Uh, and that's how we've uh, increased participants, exactly the same way as we've responded during the pandemic, to increase um, uh, vaccine uptake, uh, the community leaders working, community champions working. I think that's where we really need to invest if we want to recruit uh, appropriate number of participants to these studies. Thank you. Thanks. And th this also speaks to the point about the number of of eligible patients who are enrolled in clinical trials normally, which is vanishingly small. And not as it is vanishingly small, but it tends to be remarkably homogeneous in terms of where they're pulled from. So there is a real opportunity here to benefit everybody by getting this right and actually making sure we get better recruitment to trials, more representative trials, and pick up the things that we need to pick up as we look at differences between populations. I think uh, Tom wanted to come in. Oh, sorry, Lynn. Go ahead, go ahead. I just want to say really quickly, I mean, I, and I'm going to say this, aren't I, that I think that patient public involvement is, is central to this. I mean, I've, I've been yes. doing work with the HRA and their, their Think Ethics. I'm, I'm on the expert advisory group for that. And, and a lot of people really want to participate in trials. Make it difficult for people. Yeah. If you, you know, don't give them a choice over what, um, what times they can come. If you don't pay them travelling expenses to come up, if you make the outcomes... Um, it, you know, just so there's a cardiology trial that I could participate in that I'm not because the primary outcome is an extra 30 seconds on the treadmill without chest pain. So what what relevance does that have to me? And I think it's work and doing some stuff around the participant information sheets and about the availability of that of that information. And, and I think we could we, we could yeah we could definitely get it a lot. Better. Thank you, well, Tom. And then there was one other lady. Hmm? Yes, we're on to new we're on to new questions now. So. Uh, thanks, Tom, Tom Solomon, Liverpool. Um, we're, we're celebrating today the UK's contribution to science, but this is a question that you might all like to comment on um, in comparison with other similar countries. So uh, June, first of all, clearly the MHRA was criticised for being fast in, in approving vaccines, and then the other countries sort of followed, I think, with their tails between their legs. But I'd be interested in your reflections on that. And then maybe from, from Lynn on the patient involvement and how we compare with other similar countries and then maybe if if Kamlesh or Najib want to comment on on the diversity aspects and how again how we compare with similar countries uh in that respect and how, in, in our response to the pandemic okay June do you want to kick off if I may Tom I'll take a slightly different approach because in the international coalition of medicines regulatory authorities that I mentioned the FDA commissioned a study of all trials and the UK wasn't actually very high up. There were about 1,500 trials on COVID. And then when we looked at trials with actionable results, there was the UK. 
And the tragedy is, if the Academy can do something about this, it would be fantastic that many regulators are approving trials that are too small, underpowered, they will never give a result that will benefit a patient. And that's what the UK did. So if it comes to being proud of something, it's the immense, uh, the brilliance of the research community. Who was first over the line as a regulator? Well, it's, it's, it is what it is. The data were there. Uh, we were able through the skills of our staff to move nimbly and the links within the government that enabled our wheels to turn. It may be different in other regulators. And I think, you know, this point is highly relevant to the 100 day mission. You don't get to the 100 day mission unless you do properly sized trials that give you answers. And there was an enormous waste across the world of many, many small studies that never delivered. Then. Yeah, so I think that I would like to play, I'd like to pay tribute to the researchers that I work with that, that understand patient public involvement. And, and I think that we, we've got a really great system in the UK, but we have got far too much variation geographically between, you know, the situation with patient public involvement in Scotland compared to compared to to, to the rest. And, and what, what I would say, I think at the start of the pandemic, there was a bit of paternalism. It's like, we need to get these studies up and running quickly. We can't possibly ask people, you know, to comment in 24 hours. Well, you absolutely and totally can because I spent the whole pandemic zooming on my on my couch and answering emails and you know staying up till two o'clock in the morning to to really try and input to try and make the best research the best that it could be and and I think I think we have done that and we've done that well in the UK but there's still too much too much variation. Najib. So I think uh, from the diversity side and it's a slightly non-academic approach but again, because of the charity work, we've got lots of partners in other countries. And the key thing that came out was trust and trust in institutions. And in certain countries which have different governance structures, they could enforce trust, uh, which made people comply. And I think in other places where there was no trust, then actually it sounds awful, but the disinformation had more impact than authority. And so this goes back to this issue of community engagement to enhance trust and build trust in institutions to allow interventions to work. Um, and I think we've probably seen that a degree here in the UK where certain communities and the majority community had trust in the system, but then other communities did not trust the system. I, mean, I, have, I had patients who told, told me that go to hospital in an ambulance, come out in a coffin, I'm not gonna go there. And they would keep their family members at home dying of COVID. I had a, an African neighbor of mine who has had COVID twice, but still refuses to have the vaccine because of historical issues in Nigeria. So those are the, the legacy issues that I think, how do you reach out as authentic and credible and representative to build trust in institutions? And yeah, uh, and that's part of, the, part of the challenge. Hope that answers a little bit. And Cameron, you may want to comment because the, the, one of the points of the question was, how do we compare to others in being able to do this? Do, do you know how? We compared to others? Uh, I can certainly comment on that, uh, Patrick. I mean, the, the, in terms of ethnic minority and how disproportionately COVID affected them, this came, I, I will remember for the, this for the rest of my life. It was the 1st of April. Um, I had friends who started phoning me saying, we're seeing patients in intensive care unit, young Asians. Um, you've, you've been looking into COVID. Is, have you seen anything like this? Because until then, most of the countries that had been affected by COVID were homogeneous populations, uh, Spain, China, Italy, and hadn't reported anything on ethnicity. And the first data that came out was very quickly, it was the 4th of April, and that came from ICNARC, the intensive care unit data. And, and suddenly uh, we started uh, wondering whether this was true or not. So I spoke to Nilesh Samani that day, and that's the same day that we wrote to uh, um, Chris Whitty about uh, this potential disproportionate impact. And then I think we have been reporting on um, the area of ethnicity and deprivation more than anyone. The only two countries that have reported this is USA and the UK, but we have the best data in the world. And I think we need to be really proud of that. The way the uh, um, access to the data happened quickly, the collaborations that happened and the linkages at the pace that happened was unheard of. And since then, we've continuously published uh, large papers 
uh, whole population level papers, which have certainly shown that we do truly have the best databases. We've had uh, studies from the US that have been small single center or insurance organizations such as Medicare, which may not be represented to the whole population. And I think this is something we really now need to build on. We have a platform, we have the Digistrans platform. Uh, someone mentioned earlier that we need to have recruitment centralized. And this is, I think, a, a great opportunity for us to start looking at centralized recruitment because we've now also got the census, new census, and we will have data, up-to-date data on ethnicity, deprivation, religion, comorbidities, and we really need to work this together to see how can we uh, improve on what we've already done really well. Thanks, and, and, and as you said, there are many studies, including ISARIC and others that gave a lot of information on this uh, throughout. Um, now, I, I don't know how I get questions online, so while we're, somebody's telling it, there's nothing there that I can see. So if there are questions, it needs to come up there. And I'll take one more in the room at the moment. Okay. There's a question there. Uh, Keith Godfrey from the MRC Centre in Southampton. Um, I'd be interested in the thoughts from Patrick, yourself, if you don't mind, and June on the legacy for the UK diagnostics uh, cent uh, sector. Um, the innovation between academia, industry, government, and the regulator has been fantastic during the pandemic. And how can that be best applied both for post-pandemic and in preparation for future pandemics? Yeah. Uh, shall I have a go first, June, and, and, and then come to you? Um, the first thing to say is diagnostics has been the most tricky part in a way. So it's the least developed area from a regulatory and trials perspective. And it was the most um, diffuse in terms of companies from around the world. So it was, the, it was by far the most difficult um, part of this in terms of industry. Um, what's emerged, of course, is A, we've now got a very good infrastructure for testing in the UK. Plea number one is let's use that in the NHS and make sure that we use it for all the other things that we wished we'd be able to test for. And a second thing is, I think there is now, as part again of the 100 day mission, a very clear request from the G7 and now the G20 to say countries should use these things in routine clinical practice and develop straight streamlined regulatory approaches so we can end up with a consistent way of knowing what works and what doesn't work. And as a result of that, I think you'll get industry coalescing and coming up with things that can really be implemented and you know very early on as you remember there were claims left right and center about tests that work and you know using completely different standards very often putting incredibly high levels of um, viral antigen directly on a test and saying yes this is 100 percent sensitive well yes 100 percent sensitive if you put a shed load of stuff in front of it. that's not what you're trying to pick up so i think there were lots of complexities in that and I think there's a real need now to clean that area up and make sure that we take advantage of it. June. Certainly very challenging. The science, the technology and the public health demands just all collided. And uh, it was it's a tribute to those involved that we actually did deliver. I'm particularly proud of the target product profiles from the UK that we used around the world. And it was only when I heard from South America how they looked for these product profiles and could follow them and use them that I realized how much the UK has done to assist. But we've now got to go further. And as Patrick says, the opportunity is to work internationally to create a bespoke regulatory framework that enables and doesn't add barriers. And we're on our way working with the FDA and others. Thanks. I'm going to make sure that we crack through some other questions. So I'm going to try and make it one, one question, one person answering. So the first one's for Kamlesh from online. Should the targeted approach to vaccine access not have been widely adopted and made mainstream by the NHS for all marginalised groups to enable them to access the care they need? And the, the vaccine uh, hesitancy issue is quite interesting because we, we're talking about it now, but this has been present for many, many years. If you look at the influence of vaccine data, uh, we've had hesitancy among ethnic minority groups at population level and at healthcare professional level for many, many years, and we've never addressed it. So we really should have addressed it beforehand, but now that we do have the data, there's a lot more that needs to be done going forward um, to try and uh, improve vaccine uh, access to these populations. Yeah. 
Thank you. And I think you know, I think a lot's been learned about how to how to do this. And I think many countries around the world realised quite early on that this wasn't like giving an annual flu vaccine. You know, there are a whole different range of barriers and challenges to do this. Um, question here, which is entirely relevant, given um, the, the uh, day is named after Colin Dollery, which is, should we be considering more diverse groups in clinical pharmacology studies or trials of early studies, uh, particularly as we know that some ethnic subgroups respond differently to cardiovascular drugs? There are very few clinical pharmacology units currently that do this, June. Absolutely. And uh, it's been an experience, particularly with uh, medicines like um, some of the uh, ACE inhibitors and so forth, where we discovered what the issues were through the vigilance system. And it shouldn't be like that. We should be building in safety. So I would really welcome the chance to, perhaps in Sir Colin's name, to try and stimulate Muneer Permahamid. We've got the British Pharmacological Society next week. Why don't we bring that point up and yeah. see if the BPS will run with it? Excellent. Uh, Thank you, June. That would be good. Yes, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan and then and then um, Pauline Williams behind. Yes, uh, thank you, um, Dr. Rain. You um, differentiated between trials which were adequately powered and inadequately powered, and I wonder whether the International Coalition of Regulators or perhaps the MHRA itself um, actually stamped a quality mark on those trials which are adequate. It strikes me that. There are huge numbers of trials, and for clarity and transparency, it would be helpful if every published trial, perhaps, um, carried a quality mark. I and mean, quality assurance is so important for people. Really interesting idea. I think now the issue is in play. Those sorts of ideas should be fully thought through and debated. We're about to consult on clinical trials legislation for the UK, and I really would encourage this type of debate to continue. Um, coming at it afresh, talking with the National Institute for Health Research, I think there would be others who would like to contribute to a debate. So it's not an immediate yes, but my goodness, post-COVID, why not? And I, I, I guess you'd like to think that if regulators are really doing what you'd hope regulators are doing, the approval should be a quality mark that should ensure that the study can answer the question that's being asked. Pauline. Thank you. Uh, Pauline Williams, GSK. I think uh, we've talked about clinical trial diversity, but one um, subgroup that was underrepresented, uh, uh, underrepresented was uh, pregnant women. And I wonder what more could be done across regulators, industry and community engagement to address that for the future. Can I, can I break my rule and ask Lynn to have a, a go at that first of all and then, then go to June? It's about trust, isn't it? I, I think it's, and there was a really good article that, that I read in, um, I think it was on the BBC, that, or um, it might, might have been The Guardian. Just, and I think this is about, a lot of this is about conflicting advice and, and not listening to communities affected. And I think if there's, if there's an information vacuum, then people will fill it with a narrative that's accessible. And if that narrative is an anti-vax narrative or I don't do this narrative and it's not evidence-based, then that's what people will go to. And I think we need to get to a situation. It also comes back to working with communities and also that there being no silly questions, that, that you don't, you know, that people are able to ask these questions of clinicians, of researchers, and, and to engage in a dialogue because communication is a two-way thing. And it seemed like often what was happening was we were being told stuff, but we didn't have an opportunity, like pregnant women, you know, to, to have those conversations about personal risk, risk benefit. Well, Lynn is absolutely right. And I think it's incumbent on all of us now to do something about this gap in regulation. We shouldn't be seeing women in intensive care, most the vast majority of whom have been too frightened while they're pregnant to have their jab. And I think now that gap needs to come to the fore. I'm sure Professor Lucy Chappell will have it in her mind to do something about it. Regulators certainly have, the FDA and the EMA. So let's together, led by the patients, do something about it. It's not acceptable. And I think the CMO has been very clear about this um, need for vaccination. For pregnant women. Uh, I just add a, a very small thing to that, just about, um, about civil society organisations and community organisations. Through BEMA, we've been able to help represent communities and recruit them for organ donation, for bone marrow transplants, et cetera, by being 
you know, part of those communities. So I think civil society and third sector organizations have a role in bridging that gap as well. Thank you. Questions from the room? Yes, Patrick. Thank you, it's mainly for June. Uh, I can see June how we can do large clinical trials at an arm's length to measure an efficacy uh, outcome. The question is, uh, what approaches can we put in place to measure the side effects, which we may not know when we're doing the trial itself? So it's going back to the pharmacovigilance question, and particularly for hard to reach groups where the problem's compounded. It's, it is a real challenge, and I think we've got to think in a bespoke way down round different uh, products in you know, early use to make very clear plans about how to best reach uh, uh, people who will no doubt perhaps be reluctant to report side effects for all sorts of reasons. It's very encouraging that the actual ability to test for perhaps even a hematological abnormality at home is now becoming a reality. So let's build it in at an early stage to trial design and see if we can really improve that data capture. Thank you. We've got time for one last question from the room. Yes. Um, I just have a general question about uh, the role of the yellow card scheme with the MHRA and building on that um, earlier question about the long term monitoring of things like side effects. Um, what role do you think clinicians have in uh, sort of promoting that and being aware of uh, using that as a tool for that? Thank you. It's a long established, if you like, cornerstone of vigilance. We come and go on its role it is that vital hotline that anyone can tell us and increasingly it's been patients particularly in covid who have told us and i thank every one of them but in the data world the data driven world that we're in can we not enrich that data in ways that actually speed up detection and that's what we're here to talk about i think that the myth that you cannot test a hypothesis in a large data set you, need, you can't detect a signal, you, you test your hypothesis in a large data set. We should maybe revisit it with some of the clever uh, people who can segment data sources. So I think it needs to be there, but in a less uh, prominent way, because I think data capture will enable us to detect signals quickly in the future. And, and it is remarkable. I mean, the increase in reporting from patients during this period really tells you what the opportunity is here in terms of you know, crowdsourcing information, Lynn. Sorry, it's just, we've talked a lot about data, so there's something that really stands out for me is this um, concept that health data are humans with the tears wiped off. And I think big, need, big data needs deep data, and we need the stories, and we need the narratives, and we need the qualitative research to understand it so that we can, we can illuminate it. And, you know, I think going forward, you know, I would love to see if every big data thing that's funded, a small piece, maybe a qualitative research to sit alongside it so that we understand the issues from the, commu from the community. Sorry. No, thank you very much. So thank you thank very you. much to the panel. Please join me in thanking them for the day. <laughs> Thanks very much. So I, I just, I'm, I'm told I've got to sort of summarize and, and reflect now. And I, I'm going to just say one thing, which is it's very clear from what we've heard that science has been totally crucial right the way through the pandemic. But it's also clear that you don't end up with good results, good outcomes, if you're not diverse. And that diversity goes across disciplines. Interdisciplinar interdisciplinarity is crucial. It goes across countries, learning from each other. And of course, it goes across populations in the way that we've heard. And making sure that as we approach things, we take account of the true diversity in the population. And importantly, it comes down to how science, in any case, should be done, which is to make sure that you have multiple minds from different backgrounds trying to focus on the problem. And really difficult problems don't get solved by monolithic structures or monolithic groups. So I think that's what I'd like to take away as, as, as the final comment on this. And what I will now do is hand over to Diana Dollery, I think, who's going to come up and say, well, or Anne, you're going to come and take over from me. Thank you. Thanks very much to the panel again.
So can I also thank the panelists, but also particularly thank Sir Patrick Vallance um, as Chief Scientist Advisor to the government. He's carried an enormous load and continues to carry on his shoulders. And I think we're all very grateful to him for everything he's done and for sparing the time today, Patrick. So very many thanks for you, to you. We couldn't have uh, done today without the tremendous support we've had from the Dollarie family. And it's such a pleasure to have so many of the family here with us today, and particularly to have Lady Diana Dollery with us here today. And she has very kindly agreed to give us a few words about her late husband, Sir Colin Dollery. You've heard many of our speakers refer to his extraordinary contribution to pharmacology. And this has been a pharmacological journey alongside many other journeys that we've heard today, which has been achieved through this immense collaboration between scientists, the public, clinicians, and, and the whole multidisciplinary team we've heard over and over again. But let's hear from the person who has us the best stories to tell us, Lady Diana Dolly. Please come. <laughs> Very welcome to sit if you prefer, or you have it. Okay, right. So something to hold on to here. Yeah. Okay. My apologies, it comes from getting old. Um, so you'll have to forgive me. It was a fascinating afternoon, and I'm sure Colin would have been one of the first to ask questions. I'm sure you all know that he always rose at every meeting he went to to ask a question. Whether we yet have all the answers or even all the questions, I doubt. Following rather lurid headlines at the weekend in the Sunday Times, it may be that the pandemic will have raised questions well outside COVID. Well, actually, I think the speakers today raised a lot of things in the way we might change the way things are done. And so I, I'm sure that Colin would have approved of that. Keith Peters went through Colin's career. Well, he went through some of it, uh, but if I went on with some of the other things I could tell you about, we'd be here until midnight, and I think you'd prefer not to do that. I want to take you instead to the piece that Mary Manning wrote about Colin as treasurer in your program, and it's the first paragraph in case you haven't read it yet. Um, she describes the meeting uh, where Colin got up, uh, and I think you can, those of you who knew Colin, will have no difficulty in imagining the scene. She says, Colin was forthright in his questioning. Indeed, and he always was, without regard to personal circumstances, starting with his future in-laws, which caused a few problems. He could see with much experience of national and international organizations that the figures didn't add up. And that brings me to why he was so keen for the academy to succeed. At that time, he was very concerned at how medicine was treating, retreating into smaller and smaller silos with the proliferation of royal colleges and small specialist societies. For him, it was important that scientists should work together, including with those outside their field. They should also work with industry. Yes, big, bad pharma, who make and develop the medicines that keep us alive and the vaccines that have enabled us to be here today. So go forward, continue to question, embrace new concepts, and prepare for the next Black Swan event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lady Dolry, and thank you all for your support today. Uh, wonderful to have you here. Wonderful to hear, and I hope you will feel this meeting has been fitting to Sir Colin's memory. And we remember him with uh, great thanks for everything he did for the Academy and to you for everything I think you're doing today. So it leaves me to say thank you to you all for attending here today in our first hybrid event and to all those who are online for being with us too. And I'd like to thank uh, all our speakers and our patient representatives who have been on this journey through COVID with us all. 
and without whom none of this could have been achieved. And I'd also like to thank the AMS staff who've put an enormous amount of work into this. I don't want to summarize um, a lot of uh, what's been said because we've already heard a great summary from Patrick and I think we've summarized through the day. But we are facing the biggest public health crisis that any of us I think have experienced in our lifetime. And there are more coming down the tracks. Patrick said last week that in comparison, perhaps the existential threat of climate change may let me look um, like something much smaller. And uh, we do have to move forward as a society. i am studied public health all my life. And the clue to all this is the public. And I think we've heard that we are all members of the public, whatever our professions. And we are all going to be, we all have been and we all will be patients. And the clue is, I think, in everything that's been said today, that the public have made a huge contribution to behavioral change, societal change in the struggle we've had with this pandemic, and they will continue to do so. But alongside the many of you who have contributed in this room, I have been seriously moved by what I've heard, the efforts everybody's put in, the inventiveness, the rolling forward of ideas, but also I think we've also managed to solve some of, not solve, but really make progress on the intractable problems that existed before the pandemic. We must do something about inequalities, but we've really begun to use data better. We've come together as a community. We've begun to solve the inertia around digital health that we've heard a lot about. Thank goodness we've had June at the helm there, speeding up regulation. And we've had the patient voices. These are just a few examples of the progress we've also made by, by the pandemic. We mustn't lose that momentum. And we must for, move forward in building uh, this forum that brings so many communities together to make progress in the future. I think forum comes from the Romans originally. I'm not entirely sure. But you know, it was about communication and collaboration but it must also be about the public and making, ourselves, and making us build a more equitable society nationally and internationally. Thank you very much for your attention. It's the end of the proceedings for today. We'll turn off the screen, but I think a few of us will be able to join and, and spend a little time further together. Thank you very much indeed for being with us today. Yeah, there you go, everyone. It's finished now. So we're going to turn it off. See you later.